I'm going to let you in on a secret. I love this new trend about the iceberg videos, and I found one about Yu-Gi-Oh! And I want to give all credit to the production of this image to Dive Missile, which I found on Reddit. Although, I'm not sure if this is the original creator. I'm going to take a look at the content and do my best to describe and explain in detail what everything means without a script. So let's go. In the sky, we have the first level. The first level should be knowledge available to pretty much everyone, which is things which are fairly well known. Starting off, we have, what does Pot of Greed do? And I have no clue. Strong start. But for those of you that don't know the running gag, every character in the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, in every series of the anime, deems that it's completely necessary to explain one of the simplest card effects in the game each time they use it. Pot of Greed allows you to draw two cards from your deck. Next up is Long Card Text. It's tempting to say that Long Card Text is a problem exclusive to modern Yu-Gi-Oh, but cards like Toon Dark Magician Girl are just so verbose. The addition of Pendulum Monsters having a spell and a monster effect doesn't help though. Crystal Beast Amber Mammoth Dub Voice. I would love to pummel that little toothpick of a man. Hasta la vista, baby! Season Zero. This refers to the first season of the anime, or the season which takes place before Duel Monsters, specifically the Duelist Kingdom arc in Duel. The Yu-Gi-Oh! anime is based on the King of Games, and it wasn't exclusive to Yu-Gi-Oh! at the time. Yami Yugi, the dark counterpart to our protagonist, is the master of games and plays around with tormenting people in shadow games. It is interesting, influential, and not really related to the game we have today. Next level, tip of the iceberg. First up is missing the timing. This is confusing for most players. There is a difference, and it is a pedantic one, between if and when. For the most part, if cards do not miss the timing, since their effect activates and is mandatory. When cards have a narrow window when they can be activated. For instance, if you want to tribute summon using Petten the Dark Clown as a tribute, it goes to the graveyard, which you would think would trigger its effect, but the last thing that happened is actually the summoning of the monster. So you announce the summon, you tribute the monster, you summon the monster, Petten misses timing. Pole Position Rulings Pole Position is a card that should be banned for no other reason than it's very confusing, awkwardly worded, and just notorious for causing infinite loops. Cost versus effect. This is another semantic issue. Cost refers to something which is paid. This could be discarding cards, paying life points, tributing monsters. There's quite a lot of different costs in the game. Costs occur prior to the card's activation and are denoted with either a semicolon or a period. Effects are part of the card and resolve at the same time. These are the cards which will trigger Dark World. If you discard as a cost, it will not trigger the effect of a Dark World monster. But if you trigger as part of the card effect, like with Dark World dealings, it does trigger the monster's effect. Seekak. This is a situation for dealing with multiple mandatory effects that go off at the same time. For instance, your Mystic Tomato attacks and destroys your opponent's Mystic Tomato. What happens is turn player's mandatory effects trigger first, then optional effects for turn player, then optional effects for the opponent. It's confusing. Astrograph Sorcerer Ruling. Which one? Beneath the Surface. Red Weather Painter. 
Red Weather Painter is an illusion. Elemental Hero Mudball Man. This is an interesting card. It is a fusion between Elemental Hero Clay Man and Elemental Hero Bubble Man. It was a McDonald's promo, which might be why it's on here. Celestial Sword Iatos, missing the timing. This is another ruling. Darkness Approaches. This card had the rare distinction of being able to flip a monster into face-down attack position, which had a whole bunch of obscure and confusing rulings. The card has since had an erratum to make it much worse than Book of Moon, since it's spell speed 1 and requires two cards to be discarded. Magician's Rod Can't Search Eye of Tamias. This is a weird corner case, because Eye of Tamias specifies Dark Magician monsters, but not the monster Dark Magician. Diving Deeper. Original Wabaku text. This is just weird regionalization. Here's my copy of the original Wabaku. This card has gone through several errata, and it's trying to simplify and to make sense of the effect. Preventing all damage like a fog in magic made sense to someone in development and regionalization, but instead it makes a lot more sense to say it prevents battle damage to the player and prevents monsters from being destroyed by battle, making it a great fit for gladiator beast decks. The real reason Kaiser Colosseum is banned. I want to say the actual ban list reason, and that's because it's not engaging, it makes it a protect the castle sort of game. It is strange rulings and difficulty using and it's poor card design. But I think in actuality, the reason why it's banned is because it infringes upon design space. It's pretty easy to notice that Kaiser Coliseum fits well into decks that want to normal summon one monster or special summon one monster and maybe tribute that monster or very limited design space. It prevents a lot of different decks that focus on special summoning two monsters and then say Synchro or Xyz or Link or even Pendulum Summon. It's just a design limiting card. Missing Arcana Force Monsters. Hey! I did a whole video on the Arcana Force Monsters. There's more in the anime, but even in the anime they didn't go through all of them. Original Manga Rules. This deserves a very detailed video, but the original rules were interesting to say the least. There wasn't really the same structure. It was more like I play a card and you play a card and my card's bigger and sometimes I play a support card and it was closer to the Bondi game and you can see it in the Duelist Kingdom arc. And even through a little bit of the Battle City, where they maintain some of the rules, don't play that way. Light Pulsar Dragon pre-release errata. The Light Pulsar Dragon erratum focuses in on the if and when problem that I mentioned earlier. Specifically, the card was changed from an if effect to a when effect, so it can miss the timing. Tewart posting on Pojo. Back in the upper deck days, Tewart was involved in the Yu-Gi-Oh! distribution and regionalization in the Americas. This is a theory that he personally posted on Pojo, having insider information. Diving Deeper Elemental Hero Rampart Blaster Erratas Let's just point out that errata happens to be the plural, and the singular is erratum. I've been ignoring it this far, but this is just the most egregious example so far. This monster used to be able to attack while in defense position. Tyler the Great Warrior. This one is actually pretty sweet. Fulfilling the wish from the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Tyler was allowed to make his card, and he made Tyler the Great Warrior. This card is not used in normal play, and very few copies of them exist and were never intended to be distributed to the wider player base. Upper Deck Orikalkos Printing 
There is a rumor that they had the anime effect, all of them, on the Seal of Ori Calcos. I don't think it actually happened. Poison Butterfly Timaeus Fusion. This is something that happened in the anime, or at least didn't happen in the anime, where Yugi tries to fuse one of Weavile's monster with the Eye of Timaeus. The anime logic is weird. Cypher Soldier Light Monster Printing. Cypher Soldier, which used to be Kinetic Soldier, had a misprint. Noble Knight Joan. I bet you didn't know that there was a female Noble Knight outside of the Lady in the Lake. But more seriously, I like how there's a pretty consistent theme with the name Joan on monsters. You have Guardian Angel Joan, then you have the Light Sworn Joan, and now you have Noble Knight Joan. Mismatched Pendulum Scales. This is something that's been theorized, but hasn't actually been implemented in the game. If you haven't noticed already, every single pendulum monster has a left and a right scale, but they all have the same scale. It could have been more tactical to have mismatched scales, a high number on one side and a low number on the other, to make it more important which pendulum zone they occupied. This hasn't been implemented yet. Bottom of the Iceberg Real-life solid vision plans. This is a theory that Konami was intending to make the holograms from the anime real. And that would be really cool, some sort of augmented reality program. I'm not sure how far they got. Magic and Wizards. This was one of the working titles for the Yu-Gi-Oh! game in the manga, but had to be changed because there is a card game in the United States called Magic the Gathering, which is run by a company called Wizards of the Coast. There is a definite connection between Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic the Gathering, but I wouldn't say that it's plagiarism, but a bit of inspiration from the themes. Later sets expand and, and try new things, but the early sets had that element of dark fantasy. Bondi Cards Bondi created a Yu-Gi-Oh card set before Konami, and the cards are interesting. The actual gameplay is different and probably the subject for a future video to examine. It's more like war, with occasionally tactical cards in addition to having a bigger monster, and they're like character cards, sort of like trainer cards. I don't know about it. Definitely. A fun topic to explore later. Upper Deck Counterfeit Card Production This is the reason why Upper Deck no longer publishes Yu-Gi-Oh! and instead Konami does it itself. Going through another company there was accusations and legal disputes over counterfeit cards being inserted into packs. Misprinted Fusion Neos Wiseman in I believe the Korean? Or Japanese set. There is a misprint of the card Neos Wiseman, and instead of being an effect monster, is a fusion monster. Super Fusion God. I think this happened in Yu-Gi-Oh! R, and it's just when the three Egyptian god cards came together. In fact, there's an even better example if you look at the Sacred Beasts from GX, and then you have Armatile, which is the fusion of the three cards. Monsters taking battle damage. This comes from the anime and it is a byproduct of the solid light projections where the monsters have a character of their own and because they're characters they get acted upon by outside forces and one of those is battle damage. It doesn't make much sense in the real game but in Hearthstone there's a card called Bolf Ram Shield which takes the damage instead of you. Sort of like how your Pokemon can just tank a hit because it loves you so much. Original Appearance of Cosmic Blazar Dragon. Spooky. I think it debuted earlier than it was supposed to. Sort of like Ho-Oh in the first generation of Pokemon. Asian English Cards. I don't know exactly what the creator of the iceberg image meant, but I'm going to take advantage of this very rare opportunity and show you cards which are transliterated like Mad Jin Gun which is one of my favorites, 
because if you say it very quickly, it sounds like machine gun, and its description fits it, being able to fire projectiles. Diving deeper. Four kids Yu-Gi-Oh commercials. I don't remember any of the curb commercials, but four kids did a lot of weird things, so I wouldn't put past them to, to bring up something weird. Yu-Gi-Oh! Anime Timeline. This is a rabbit hole. It's actually pretty cool. I suggest this video. Edo Pro was made by Konami. Edo Pro is an automated Yu-Gi-Oh! simulator similar to Wygo Pro and its successor. I believe this theory 100% that a disgruntled Konami employee went out and created a service that's similar to the game and encourages user interaction more so than anything that Konami puts out. It's just hard to monetize, maybe if you had a subscription service, but the recurrent revenue that is generated in all the other products that have been put out, such as Duel Links, being a terrible Skinner box and having randomized products very similar to gambling, and you have your users generating the content for the game, and they are continuously incentivized to spend money in order to alleviate the terrible grind in the Skinner box. Add that with randomized reward schedule because packs are random and feel like gambling, and you have a terribly addictive video game system. I 100% believe that there are people that love the game and can't stand the marketing. And perhaps at least one of those people came from Konami with intimate knowledge of the game and decided to use it for good. Millennium Thousand Eyes Virus. This is a card that was teased by Talwart. It probably doesn't exist, but it is as powerful as a combination of Thousand Eyes Restrict and Crush Card Virus, just to put it into perspective. Yu-Gi-Oh cards as tarot cards. This is aftermath from the Satanic Panic, in my opinion, that people saw monster cards and affiliated them with the occult, which in some cases is true. I actually had a friend who, who I gave a deck of cards to, and he had to give it back because his mom said he wasn't allowed to play Satanic games. <laughs> Serpent Nazca line predictions. This has to deal with the Crimson Dragon. In my opinion, this is a retelling of the Leviathan story from Duel Monsters, and it is a prediction that it will come again. Real Egyptian Origins of Yu-Gi-Oh. Quite a lot of the cards come directly from Egyptian mythology, and it is wonderful. We have the obvious examples like the Wingret Dragon of Ra, or Osiris, which got changed in regionalization to be Slifer, the executive producer. But you also see Anubis and plenty of other influences in the game. The Abyss. We are at the bottom of the image. Mech lords are real. They haven't manifested themselves because they can only be special summoned based on the destruction of monsters. Skydiving Field. This is a ridiculous anime card, you have to play the game while skydiving. Rescue Rabbit's true effect. To pull any two monsters out of your deck. They don't even have to be the same level. They don't even have to be Yu-Gi-Oh cards. You could pull a magic card and a Pokemon card out of your deck if you wanted to. All pack opening videos are staged. I can personally attest to this, as I have opened some packs on video. And I pulled a Rainbow Karibo, so that might be staged. Getting a, getting a secret rare out of a single pack. Darkly Big Rabbi. This is a weird counterfeit card. OCG pulls are rigged. Always have been. Winged Karibo level 9 was the first Link monster. I don't know about this one. There's definitely a connection between Karibo and every single series in the anime. 
Wing Karibo level 9 in particular is just weird. Guard transcendent wings and being special summoned on your opponent's turn and because they get a replay battle they might not even attack so your opponent can just avoid it by not attacking you. But Link Karibo's good I guess. Finally, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a CIA PSYOP. This is probably the most controversial, it is true, but the most controversial issue on the entire list. On the coattails of MKUltra, it was increasingly obvious that the failure with the Manchurian candidate programming was the result of poor test subject selection and a new procedure for acquiring test subjects was necessary. Drawing from the occult and emergent virtual reality simulations, the game was devised to isolate intelligent individuals with foresight in deck building and dynamic problem solving ability. The verisimilitude of primitive solid light projections is hampering the initiative, but very soon all the pieces will come into play and the next phase of the protocol will be initiated. If you ever see a man in gray surreptitiously observing your locals, avoid him at all costs.